Hello, and welcome to the Biotechnology and Society webinar series, co-sponsored by the Museum of Science and the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics. I'm your host, In Siu Hyun. I am the director of the Center for Life Sciences at the Museum of Science. The series brings together speakers and you, the audience, on interesting cutting edge areas of research at the intersection of biotechnology and society. Now, if you're here with us today, you're probably like me and you love dogs. Um, for centuries, we've known that dogs and humans have coexisted and probably helped each other survive. Uh, when we were back at a hunter-gatherer society and we had our companion dogs, domesticated dogs, at our side. We can learn so much about the intersection between the lives of humans and the lives of dogs. And to help us think through what else we're learning about our relationships with dogs is Dr. Daniel Promislo, who is a professor in the Department of Biology at Washington University School of Medicine. He is the PI on a project called the Dog Aging Project, which brings together thousands of dogs and their human companions across the US to teach us something about not only aging in dogs, but also possibly aging in human beings. Daniel, it's great to have you here with us today. Welcome. Thank you, I'm really delighted to be here. Now, I'm so curious about this project. I mean, I might con consider this one of the largest citizen science projects ever. Um, how did this project come about? Can you tell me about like, sort of like how this began and uh, how it's going so far? Sure. Um, so I've worked on aging my whole career. I started studying aging as a graduate student back in the late 80s. And I worked on variation. I'm really interested in why organisms vary. Why do you and I look different? Why do elephants and mice look different, especially in terms of aging? And so I was thinking about variation and aging. And back in 2007, a paper came out in the journal Science. That's the top science journal in America. And on the cover of that issue was a picture of a Great Dane and a Chihuahua walking side by side. I remember that cover. And that story was about the genetics of size in dogs. And what mm -hmm. Dr. Elaine Ostrander, who's a leader in dog genetics, and her group showed was that there was a single gene that accounted for almost half of the difference in size between the giant breed dogs and the tiny dogs. That's notable. If you think about a, a trait like size in humans, there are probably thousands of genes, each of which contribute a tiny, tiny bit to determine whether we're going to be tall or short, like our parents. In dogs, there's one gene that has a huge effect. That gene is called insulin growth factor one. And I knew already that that was a gene that other researchers had shown was associated with aging. There's something really interesting about dogs. The large breed dogs are much shorter lived than the small breed dogs. So dogs, size, genetics, and aging, it all started coming together in my mind, but I didn't know anything about dogs at the time. I was a professor at the University of Georgia in the genetics department, and across the street was the veterinary school. So I called over there. They introduced me to Kate Creevy, and Dr. Creevy wrote back and said, I don't know anything about aging. I probably can't help you, but I'm happy to meet. And that's typical, typ her <laughs> typical modesty. Um, Dr. Creevy is now the chief veterinary officer. So long story short, we met 15 years ago, and we realized there was this enormous unmet need and opportunity to learn a lot about aging by studying dogs. And that's the, the short story of how we got to where we are today. Now, how did you get funding for something like this? This seems like an uh, unusual project by scientific standards. We're funded by a U19 grant from the National Institute on Aging. And actually, the, the National Institute on Aging, it's one of the institutes of the National Institutes of Health. And they're really interested in aging in people, of course, but they also fund a huge amount of work in different organisms because they appreciate that we can learn a lot about aging by studying everything from yeast and tiny nematode worms to fruit flies and mice. And when Dr. Creevy and I first started writing about aging in dogs, someone from NIH, from the National Institute on Aging, actually reached out to me and said, we're interested in this. We'd like you to 
consider writing a network planning grant to start talking about how to fund larger studies. Mm -hmm. So we did that and that was funded. And then eventually we got to the point where we had enough information and enough people on our team that it's very much a, about team science. We put all these experts together and we wrote a large grant to the National Institute on Aging to build the infrastructure for this large study. And I'll give you a little bit of details later when I show some slides. Sure. So what are some big similarities and big differences between aging in dogs and aging in people? As people age from the age of about 20 or so, the risk of dying doubles about every eight years. When we're in our 20s, it's fortunately extremely low. Um, but it, even in our mid-20s, it starts increasing exponentially, doubling about every eight years. And in fact, that pattern of exponential increase in mortality risk is the same. Not only We see it not only in humans, we see it in fruit flies, which is what I study in my laboratory, and we see it very clearly in dogs. So if you look at the mortality trajectory of a dog, it looks very much like that of a human population, only sped up. There's an understanding in, uh, among the, uh, pop, there's popular understanding that uh, a dog year is about seven human years. Mm -hmm. In fact, it depends on the breed. As I mentioned earlier, some breeds like Great Danes or other giant breed dogs, Bouviers, mm -hmm. are unfortunately very short-lived. And so there, a dog year might be just four or five, or rather might be 10 or 11 human years, very sped up. Um, a Chihuahua could live easily 15 or 16 years, mm -hmm. um, but they all age in that same pattern. They get the same, many of the same diseases as they age. They get cancer, they get many kinds of heart disease, kidney disease, cognitive dysfunction, and in fact, that's something we're studying in our population. Mm -hmm. So many of the, the diseases of aging that we struggle with, osteoarthritis, musculoskeletal challenges, the same in dogs. There are some interesting differences. Dogs don't tend to get vascular disease, so heart, heart attack and stroke, very rare in dogs. Mm. They get type 1 diabetes, but they don't tend to get type 2 diabetes. One last thing I'll add, many dogs, like many people, struggle with obesity. That is a big aging risk for dogs as it is for people. Sure. Now, you mentioned the difference in lifespan of a Great Dane or a very large breed versus a small one like a Chihuahua. Uh, in the Dog Aging Project, you enroll dogs of just all types, right? Great Danes, Chihuahuas, mixes. How, do you, uh, how does that confound or does that confound the science? That actually gives us the opportunity to do what we want to do. So we are still enrolling. If any of your listeners are interested in going to dog, dogagingproject.org uh -huh. and signing up their dog, they're welcome to. And importantly, we welcome dogs of all ages, new puppies all the way up to geriatric dogs. We're really interested in variation. By studying variation in the traits that were like lifespan, we have the opportunity to uncover the causes of that variation. What are the genes that affect lifespan? What are the environmental risk factors that increase or decrease risks of aging? So we actually embrace diversity, we embrace variation, because that's what gives us the very opportunity to ask why is that Chihuahua able to live so much longer than that Great Dane? Now, what does participation look like for uh, a human being and their and their dog companion? I mean, what, what does it mean to participate in the study? The, the Dog Aging Project uh, is successful because of the generosity of the participants. They go to our website and sign up. They're then invited to create their own private password protected portal. And we never will release any private information about the participant owners. And then we ask them to fill out a 10 part survey. And those parts are really critical to understanding the aging process. We ask them questions about diet and exercise, about health, about the environment, about the dog breed. And so the first level of participation is filling out that survey. Importantly, this is what we call a longitudinal study. And that just means that we come back every year and we say, we're back, please fill out the follow-up survey. 
the real scientific power of a study like this comes in it being a longitudinal study because then we can ask whether what happens today somehow causes healthy or unhealthy aging two, three, four years in the future mm -hmm. because, of, because we're tracking people over time or their dogs over time. A subset of the participants are invited to join one of our sampled cohorts. Those are subsets of dogs to which we'll send a cheek swab, for example, to swab the cheek to collect cells for us to measure the dog's DNA. Or they might even be enrolled in one of our cohorts where we send them a kit to take to the veterinarian to collect blood and fecal samples and hair and urine, which are then sent to us to do more biology. And of course, importantly, we're not just asking for people to generously share information and samples with us. It's very important as an open science project that we share what we discover with them. So for example, if we receive a blood sample from a dog and we do a complete blood count and blood chemistry, just like your uh, viewers would get if they went to the doctor, we will share that information with the owner and their veterinarian. So it's really a, a two-way street here. They're sharing with us and we're sharing with them. What kind of information do you collect about the owners? Um, we collect a little bit of information about the owners, including uh, where they live. That's really important because with that information, we can calculate um, from publicly available databases, like from the Environmental Protection Agency, information about air quality and water quality and green cover from trees. So we collect information about the owner's environment from the address. Some basic demographic information, um, age, uh, ethnic background, um, and educational attainment, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, income level. And of course, these are all voluntary, um, and we don't require anybody to, to release that if they're not comfortable doing that. So mm -hmm. just a little bit of information. I will say, and this might jump ahead to, to later questions, we're very interested someday in altering, in adding some components to the study where we begin to collect health information from the owners. Because what we're really interested in is whether there are similarities between challenges, health challenges that owners face and health challenges that their dogs face. Mm -hmm. If so, oh, that would suggest that there are common environmental risk factors that we could identify and call Sentinel, kind of like the canary in the coal mine, showing us in months or years rather than decades that there is a risk factor in that environment for aging. Are there potential benefits and risks for the dog participants for being in the study? So the only risk for participating in the study is that you have to spend some time filling out these surveys. And, um, but we protect the owner participant, the participant privacy. So we'll never release names or addresses or anything like that. So in that sense, the, the risks are really minimal. There are different levels of participation for the owners and dogs. So the first level, which is the largest group, um, we call the Dog Aging Project Pack. Those dogs simply have survey information filled out about them by the owners. The next level, the foundation cohort, just gets cheek swabs. Uh, and there's virtually no risk to the owner uh, putting a little cut swab into the dog's cheek. The next level, the precision cohort, those are the dogs that go to the veterinarian. And uh, again, minimal risk. Uh, veterinarians routinely take blood samples from dogs, fecal samples from dogs, so extremely minimal risk. We do have a clinical trial, and that makes up about 1% of all the dogs in our study. So we have now over 47,000. When the clinical trial is fully enrolled, there will be 580. And this is a placebo-controlled, doubly masked study. So that means that half the dogs get the drug, mm -hmm. half the dogs get a placebo, 
the scientists don't know and the participating owners don't know which dog is getting the placebo and which is getting the drug. So it's really being run like a gold standard human trial. And there, there might be risks to the dog of participating in the study due to side effects from the drug. The drug that uh, we're using is called rapamycin. In the laboratory, many studies have found that at very low doses, it extends lifespan in many different model systems in the lab, in, uh, in nematode worms, in fruit flies, in yeast, in mice. It also increases health, what we call health span in mice. It keeps mice healthier longer. So we're testing whether rapamycin will keep dogs healthier longer. The dogs are on one year of rapamycin or placebo, and then we'll continue to follow them for two years. Mm -hmm. So there the risk could be side effects from the drug. We have carried out pilot studies where we didn't see side effects. And so far, over 100 dogs are have enrolled in the study, and we aren't seeing problems with the drugs. So we believe that the risks are truly minimal for this clinical study. But safety is our number one priority. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have an, an external independent animal welfare advisory board that monitors everything we do. And then the National Institutes of Health has also constituted a data and safety monitoring board for our clinical trial, just as they would for a human clinical trial. Okay. I, I want to note for our audience that later we'll be taking questions from you in the audience. And if you have a question for Dr. Promislo or, or for me, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And later we'll be joined by Lauren Walsh, my colleague, my uh, co-instructor for this. And she'll be taking us through some of those questions that have come in. Um, so, uh, Daniel, I, I'm, I'm curious. The clinical study you're describing, that seems to sit in a new spot. So it's, it's not like the kind of clinical study we'll do with human patients. It's, it's not a typical animal research protocol uh, where you have laboratory animals and they're kept in a facility and you know given medicines and, and monitored every day. These are, these are dogs that live in people's homes. Um, what do you think would be the best framework for thinking about ethically, this, in, in a regulatory sense, this type of research? I think you've once compared this to something like pediatric research. That's a, a great question. Um, let me first say that there, there is actually a large precedent for clinical trials in companion animals, cats and dogs, um, for diseases like cancer. Um, these are regularly carried out. and. Dogs are treated for cancer just like people are, and uh, owners are typically very enthusiastic about participating in clinical trials when their dogs are, or cats are sick with something like cancer. One of the things that's notably different about this particular clinical trial is that these are healthy dogs. Mm -hmm. So we're testing for the ability of a drug to keep them healthier longer. These are middle-aged dogs, so they're at risk of, of aging-related problems, but they don't have them yet, as far as we know. The, the similarity between children and companion animals is a really good one in the sense that infants especially can't communicate consent for us. So one of the really important things that we appreciate now in a way that, unfortunately, we, we didn't 75 or 100 years ago is the absolute fundamental right of patients to consent to be in a trial. We don't just put people in trials, we ask if they consent, and we make sure that they understand what it is that we're asking them to do. Dogs obviously can't understand that, nor can infants. And so in that sense, we rely on a similar uh, level of trust of the parent in the case of an infant, and the owner in, ca in the case of a, of a companion animal, neither of those can willingly give their own consent. And so in that sense, we also need to be extremely careful. The one other thing I'll add is that when I was growing up in the 1970s, uh, people thought of dogs quite differently. The, the cartoon dog of my childhood was Snoopy. And as anyone old enough to remember will know, Snoopy slept outside. And uh, the cartoon dogs of today tend to sleep at home on the couch. <laughs> they don't sleep outside. 
People think of their dogs now as members of the family. Some even consider them or call them their children. Uh, so when we think about enrolling dogs in clinical trials, we need to bring that same sensitivity to bear to the work that we're doing. Yeah. Just because a dog can shake doesn't mean that he's given his consent, right? But uh, now I I'm curious about the motivations of the of the uh, dog owners that enroll in this. Are they hoping, because they are enrolling healthy dogs, are they hoping for some kind of clinical benefit for their dog? That they're hoping that maybe by being in this study, their companion or loved companion will live a little bit longer? Do you think that's part of the motivation? Yeah, it, it's a good question. And, and let me come back to that in a moment. And I just want to uh, to underscore one other rationale for why, why even try this in dogs. Um, so there are many people who are doing clinical trials on aging now in people. This is a new thing. Uh, people have been talking about it for at least a few decades. They're now starting to do it. But these clinical trials are not designed to test if drug interventions can make people live longer. Because people live so long, it would take 50 years to do that study. Rather, they're looking at improvement in function, um, frailty, reduced disease. It's very hard to study lifespan. Because the dog is unfortunately so short-lived, we can do this in just a few years, starting with middle-aged dogs. So there's a real power to the dog in that we can actually do what is the first real-world clinical trial asking if we can extend healthy lifespan in our own environment. It may not be in people, but it's in an animal that, that shares its environment with us mm -hmm. that gets the same aging-related diseases. Yeah. So, so there's real power to that. The question then is, well, what's the motivation for the participating people? It really varies. Um, of course, every participant is unique. Um, I think the over, overwhelming message that, that we get from people is that they recognize that this may or may not have an impact on their dog. We're doing the clinical trial because we don't actually know if rapamycin is going to help dogs live healthier longer. That's why we do clinical trials to ask the question. If it turns out to help, there are many owners, half the owners have dogs that are on placebo. They also appreciate that the only way that we can test the drug is by also testing on placebo. And the, the bottom line is that the, part, the owners are keen to help the dogs of the future. They recognize that this may not help their dog, but if it can help us help future dogs, the dog owning population in America is all about that. It, it, people really are enthusiastic about helping dogs of the future. Many are hopeful that a rapamycin is going to help dogs live longer, healthier or longer, and that their dog is on rapamycin, but there's no guarantee. Mm -hmm. Now, rapamycin targets the heart, is that correct? R rapamycin is a really interesting drug. It has very many uh, downstream effects. So it's commonly used in human populations to prevent rejection after transplant, both solid organ transplant and bone marrow transplant. And that's at quite a high dose. What people have discovered in the lab over the last decade or so is that much lower doses have this impact on, on health span. It targets a pathway that's called mTOR, or the mechanistic target of rapamycin. And it influences nutrient uptake in cells. Uh, in terms of the systems that it affects, what people have shown in mice, for example, at low dose, is that it improves heart function late in life. So it improves left ventricular heart function so that the heart is pumping more efficiently. It also improves cognitive function. Uh, uh, so mice are not only living longer, but they're living healthier longer. Their hearts are pumping better, their minds are working better. And so uh, within the study that we're doing that is part of the Dog Aging Project, and remember this is just 1% of our dogs, um, we are asking not only if the dogs are longer lived, but also half of the dogs are going to be working with cardiologists, to, with veterinary cardiologists to study the heart. The other group are going to be working with veterinary neurologists to study their cognitive ability. You know, when I was preparing for today's webinar, I circled the date on my calendar and I realized it was exactly a year ago that my dog passed. 
He was a wine rhymer, 12 years old, had kidney failure. Is there anything that you guys are learning that might address kidney issues? What I was told by my vet was if your dog lives long enough, is lucky enough to live long, uh, live long sometimes the, it's usually the kidneys that'll take them out. Um, are you learning anything about kidney function? Yeah, that, so um, that's true that, that uh, age is a really strong risk factor for, for loss of kidney function in dogs and cats as well. Um, so yeah, we're, we're actually starting to learn about all kinds of diseases because we have so many dogs in our population. We see lots of just about any disease, unless it's extremely rare. Um, so we're just beginning uh, to, anal to analyze specific diseases. Uh, in some early analysis, one of the, the uh, things that I did quite early on as the data started coming in was just looking at sex differences in kidney function. Um, and this is work that is not yet published, but the preliminary data suggested that we were seeing some sex differences in risks of, of kidney function with age that the veterinary community might not be aware of. And um, I think one of the things that we are going to learn, uh, I think in the next two to three years, um, is a great deal about which diseases show sex differences with age and which don't in a way that a veterinarian might not notice from day to day especially if these patterns are breed specific and a veterinarian, for example, might not see hundreds of Weimar runners a year, whereas we have hundreds of Weimar runners in our study. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna turn to audience questions in a moment. So while Lauren is queuing those up, let me just ask uh, another question. So it's striking to me that um, NIH is funding this study because one might expect that this would be something that people have some skepticism about whether or not the results can translate to human. Um, what do you say, what do you think about that skepticism? There are people who might say, you know, this is really great and interesting for dog aging, but you really can't take these results and extrapolate to human. Yeah, so I think it's a, a good and a, an important question. Um, I would say two things to start. First of all, um, of all the model organisms that we study uh, for all diseases, um, the most common ones are probably yeast, nematode worms, which are tiny worms, just the size of a pencil dot, fruit flies, mice, rats, some not as much as we used to. Um, we've learned a huge amount from those species about human disease and treating human disease. Dogs are more like us in the diseases that they get, in how long they live, and in the environment they live in, which is our environment. So in that sense, I think they're a, a really powerful model uh, for aging and maybe better than some of the other model organisms. Mm -hmm. And and then I, I want to give an example that's not actually about disease, but about normal development that your audience might appreciate. And, and I think of this one because I study fruit flies. So some decades ago now, um, the Nobel Prize was awarded for years of research on the development of the fruit fly embryo. So why would the Nobel Prize Committee care about a fruit fly embryo, other than a lot of your listeners are probably wondering if I have secrets to get rid of fruit flies in the summertime from their kitchen. Actually, it turns out that the genes that regulate development in the early developing fruit fly from egg to embryo are the same genes that regulate human development. If you were to take one of our genes that's regulating the eye, for example, telling our developing embryo where to put our eyes, put that into a fruit fly, it will turn on the eye in a fruit fly. Mm -hmm. So what we learn from the biology of these model organisms often can teach us really fundamental lessons about our very own biology. So I'm confident that the dog is actually one of the best models we could study for aging. Wonderful. Uh, so I'm going to ask Lauren if we have questions that, uh, we do. that we can turn to. Mm -hmm. so, so dovetailing with Insia's last point, we have a lot of interest from the audience on longevity of humans. So we have a number of questions asking, why not do this clinical trial component, the rapamycin studies with human subjects? So the first challenge to doing the kind of study that we're doing in dogs and humans would be 
that we couldn't actually answer the same question. So the, our primary question, the primary outcome of our study is asking the question, does low dose rapamycin for a year in a companion dog increase how long it lives? So we one could hypothetically ask that question starting from in humans, but if we did the same thing in healthy middle-aged humans, let's say a 60-year-old human, we would have to wait 30 or 40 years to get the answer. And uh, that's much longer than the typical five-year duration of a graduate student, for example, or a grant from NIH. So the, the first challenge is that it would just take a long time. There are obviously lots of ethical considerations as well that we would need to keep in mind. That said, there are many clinical trials now underway that are shorter term clinical trials, one or two or three years, in people asking whether drugs that have been discovered in laboratories doing research on aging in model organisms might improve some single aspect of aging in humans, not lifespan, but something else. So people are, in fact, starting to do clinical trials in humans. Mm -hmm. A related question is on, and it might, it might be too soon for you to tell, but there are a few questions on what you anticipate the practical applications of the clinical research results to be for humans. Sure. Um, so I actually want to broaden the question a little bit first, and I'll come back to that. So um, the, in terms of the implications of the study overall, one of the things that I didn't mention, but which I'm really passionate about, is that all the data that we collect, and we have, in terms of the survey data that we've collected so far and the environmental data, we have about 40 million data points. In terms of the genetics, we have about 63 billion pieces of genetic information, huge amounts of data, and we make it all publicly available. So the global scientific community is a part of the study. Anybody can access these data and, and be a part of it. So that's a really important impact um, as an open science study. Now, the, the more direct impact of this clinical trial, if it turns out that rapamycin increases healthy longevity in the dogs in our trial, that tells us that a drug that increases healthy longevity in a laboratory setting, which is in a single genotype, in a controlled environment, if it also works in a completely unrelated species that is genetically very variable, like all of us on this webinar are, living in variable environments like we all do, if that drug still has the same impact, then that would give us quite a bit of confidence that it's likely that rapamycin at appropriately low doses could improve healthy aging in humans. We don't actually know that yet. We only know what it does in a very controlled genetic background, in a very controlled environment in a laboratory. Let me interject quickly with another question. How far away are you from knowing the answer to the question, does rapamycin make a difference in lifespan, health span? So we, we are still some years away, probably four years. The, the study design, <laughs> is that as soon as a dog enrolls and gets its first dose, whether that's a rapamycin or placebo dose, it gets that for a year, and then we follow it for two years. And we even during those two years, we don't know whether it was on rapamycin or placebo. When all the dogs, 580 of them, have completed that three-year study, then we unmask the whole study and we start analyzing the data. Um, we're still recruiting. Um, we, so we're recruiting large breed, middle-aged dogs, seven years and older. Um, so if any people watching this are interested in potentially being a part of this clinical trial, you can reach out to us at dogagingproject.org. So as we're still recruiting, we think about another year to fulfill the recruitment. So probably in about four years, we will have an answer, which is better than the 30 or 40 years that it would take for a human trial. We have some cat lovers in the audience who are curious why dogs and not cats, for example. Great question. The first thing I will say is there is actually a cat aging project in Bristol in England, and we talked to the cat aging project folks. Um, uh, 
There are some challenges to studying aging in cats. One is that they live a good deal longer than dogs. And so it would take us that much longer to learn from cats what we can learn from dogs. And secondly, that enormous amount of variation that we talked about um, at the beginning uh, is not, we see that variation in dogs, not only in terms of the, the visible variation, the physical patterns. If any of you walk by a dog park and you might see a Weimaraner and a sheepdog and a Chihuahua and an Aussie Shepherd and so on, um, and they all look completely different. Turns out that they also differ in the diseases that they're at risk of. There are breeds that are very unlikely to get cancer and other breeds like the golden retriever, for example, which unfortunately has about a 50-50 chance of getting cancer. And so that variation is, is very powerful for us. And we don't have as much of that variation in the cat world. Speaking of comparisons, we have a question on how the lifespan of a domesticated dog, such as a companion animal, differs from a wild dog like a wolf. Um, for their size, um, wolves live about the same as, as we see, uh, let's say, an 80 or 100 pound dog, uh, domesticated dog. So um, about the same, uh, we, there, there are breeds that are quite a bit shorter lived. And uh, in, in the, especially uh, in the creation of certain purebred dogs, um, as we create those breeds, we tend to inbreed them. They become part of a closed pool. They lose their genetic variation. And in some cases, they become genetically fixed for certain diseases. And so there are some breeds that are quite, quite a bit shorter lived than wolves, for example. And it might be partly because of that. Uh, the extremely large breeds tend to be shorter lived. There's there seems to be a cancer risk to being very large. And then even some smaller breeds, uh, for example, what we call the brachycephalic or flat-faced breeds, some of those really struggle with respiratory problems, for example, uh, which cause relatively short lifespan. Uh, so the, the, there's a lot of, obviously, a lot of variation from breed to breed, but the wolves in the wild do pretty well. Um, my guess, I haven't looked at the data, but my guess is that early life uh, survival is lower in the wild um, because there are so many other risk factors. It's probably somewhat like uh, human lifespan used to be. Uh, one of the reasons that we're so much longer lived now than, the, than we were in 1800 is because in 1800, most people didn't make it through childhood. My guess is that wolves in the wild probably have a harder time making it through puppyhood than domesticated dogs. We have another question on the considerations that you make to ensure the research aligns with the dog's well-being. That's a really important question. So first and foremost, that the vast majority of our dogs are part of an observational study just like a human observational study. And, and as we discussed earlier, the risks are, are really minimal. In some cases, um, the, the dog is, uh, the only way that the dog is involved is that the owner is telling us online about the dog's health. Um, the, the most important element of our study, that 1% of the dogs enrolled in the clinical trial are the ones where there is the greatest consideration for risk. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, we have both an internal watchdog group. So we have a pediatric bioethicist who has generously joined our project over the years, Dr. Ben Wilfond, who's at the University of Washington and uh, Seattle Children's. And his perspective is very powerful for us because he thinks about pediatric ethics, about ensuring the welfare of young patients who can't communicate their needs. And we're talking about canine patients who can't communicate their needs. We also have an external animal welfare advisory board led by Dr. Lisa Moses, 
in Boston. And Dr. Moses is a veterinary palliative care expert. So she spent her whole career working with end of life care in dogs. And she's also a trained bioethicist. And so she thinks very deeply about uh, the ethical issues around animal welfare from a veterinary perspective. And I actually meet with Dr. Wilfon and Dr. Moses every month to discuss any ethical issues that might arise and to be very forward looking to even consider issues that haven't arisen, but, but might arisen uh, within the clinical trial. The number one criteria in my mind is not efficacy. Our number one goal, our first goal is not to somehow prove or show that rapamycin is going to increase lifespan. Our number one goal is safety and everything follows after that. We have a question trying to ascertain the convenience of participating in the study. So this question is about the blood samples. Are the samples so tightly timed that participant owners would have to take their dogs in specially for the sample, or could they do this as part of their routine veterinary visit? If a dog is chosen for one of the cohorts that involve, that includes blood sampling, we inform them that they've been enrolled in that cohort, and then we ask them to arrange for that collection during their regular veterinary visits. So that could be planned six, month, six months out. Um, so we actually have a large communication team ba based at Texas A&M, and they work with the owners to do exactly what this uh, questioner is asking to make sure that everything is done in a way that maximizes the convenience to the owner so that we can help them to help us. Are there, any, are there any dog cohorts that you need more of uh, in, this, in this project? So um, some of the cohorts are already filled, but we always have new cohorts. The, the one that we're currently most excited about working to fill and complete is actually our clinical trial. So if anybody is interested in joining the project but not interested in the clinical trial, we would love to have you. So you're very welcome. If you are interested in participating in the clinical trial, we have about 20 sites around the country. So you would, uh, if you were eligible for the clinical trial um, and we would welcome you to, to, to apply, um, there are about 20 sites in the country, so likely one that would be near you. And we're very uh, eager to fill that cohort and we will help people uh, with every step of the enrollment process, uh, if they're interested, to make that as easy as possible. So we, we, I should mention, we call that study TRIAD, which stands for Test of Rapamycin in Aging Dogs. So if you were to go online and just look up Dog Aging Project TRIAD, uh, you'll discover the link for how to, how to apply. We have a question on how rapamycin works. So does it have anything to do with telomeres or telomere activity? As far as we know, rapamycin has nothing to do with telomeres. Um, it's involved in the signals that happen in a cell that help determine how nutrients are acquired and allocated. So it's, it's more about energy the telomeres are about what happens to the chromosomes as cells divide. And many people think that they are an important, one important element of aging. Um, and we think that as the telomeres on the ends of the chromosomes get very short, that uh, cells are at risk of, uh, of dying and that can cause problems. But we think that uh, of the many different hallmarks of aging, the those associated with uh, nutrient signaling and telomeres are probably mostly independent. I say probably because I also believe that everything is ultimately connected. We have a question on what you think the impact of the research will be on both comparative medicine and possibly public health. That's a great question. Um, so this is, uh, to my knowledge, it's the largest open science, uh, community science study of aging in the world. Um, and in that sense, uh, I think it's changing the landscape. It's bringing 
thinking knowledge about aging and aging research to the general public. I think that's really a great impact. Um, and it's giving people a really good appreciation. Uh, and I think these came up with really nice questions earlier for the power of uh, what many call this one health perspective that uh, one health refers specifically to comparative studies between veterinary species, uh, whether it's dogs and cats or cows and goats and chickens and humans, that what veterinary medicine learns can inform human medicine and what human medicine learns can inform veterinary medicine. I think we are right in the middle with this study and so I'm very excited about that. Um, and then the, the last part of your question about public health. So if you think back to, to what the basic questions are about the Dog Agent Project, we're trying to understand how biology and environment shape variation in aging and age-related disease. And that environment question is really key here. The environment that dogs live in is the same as the environment that we live in. So if a dog lives in a home with, uh, we now know, for example, that our furniture um, often contains volatile organic compounds that are risk factors. Um, we might be able to discover, because dogs age so quickly, that those risk factors are present in the environment and to better quantify the public health risk of those volatile organic compounds. If uh, I have a, a master's student uh, in my laboratory right now, Abby Marie, um, Abby is working with me and my colleague, Noah Snyder-Mackler, to look at the risk of smoke from wildfires on health in dogs. And again, because things happen so much more quickly in dogs, the molecular signatures that Abby is looking at and identifying might help us point to specific risks that we should be thinking about for human populations that are exposed to wildfire. And this is going to be more and more of a public health challenge as wildfires become ever more present because of climate change. We certainly experienced uh, in the Northeast a tremendous effect from the, the wildfires north of the 49th parallel in Canada. Um, so there's so many, this is just one example. So the, the answer is absolutely, there are so many ways in which the Dog Aging Project will contribute to discoveries that are relevant for thinking about public health. Mm -hmm. Just like with humans, I think there's an obesity problem with pets, right? With dogs. Um, does that, would, would that complicate your results as well? Because that could shorten life uh, of a companion animal. Um, yeah, so the, I, I, I think that's a really important question. The one, um, the, the one change I would make to the question is instead of saying complicate, I would actually say enhance our results because it, again, it gives us the opportunity to ask this question, what is the risk of obesity? But also because we're collecting a lot of molecular information. So I'm gonna throw out a few terms here. Not only do we, do we collect survey data for many of the dogs, we collect uh, every year, we, we collect information about the metabolome. So that's a measure of all the small molecules circulating in the blood, the epigenome, that's a measure of the structure of the chromosomes, the microbiome, the fecal microbiome, so all the, the bugs, the bacteria and viruses um, in fecal samples. Um, and we, we use a method called flow cytometry to identify all the different kinds of cells in the immune system. All of these different measures are going to help us not only identify if, for example, obesity is associated with aging, but the mechanisms by which obesity becomes a risk factor for aging. And then we can translate that right back to humans and ask if those things that we've identified in our canine cohorts are also showing up at a molecular level in people. Do you see this approach being used to tackle other scientific questions besides aging? I mean, it sounds like you're spinning off all these other really interesting analyses from the aging framework, but, but what if someone were to say, you know, I want to do what they're doing, but I want to study a different question. 
Yeah. So one of the things that excites me so much about the Dog Aging Project is that we've spent the last five years not only doing science and writing papers about dogs, but creating this infrastructure. And so if someone were to come, al come along now and say, I would like to enroll a, a cohort of a thousand dogs to ask the specific question of what is the risk of a particular dietary nutrient or on kidney function or um, what is the relationship between exercise and Alzheimer's disease in a dog? Is it protective? And really anything is possible. And we have that infrastructure to very nimbly do that work. So even though our work is funded by a U19 grant from the National Institute on Aging, people have already funded other grants that build upon our work uh, not just from NIH, but in fact, other organizations have also been funding research studies. So one of the things that I'm really excited about is anything is now possible. And I, I want to offer one example that's actually not from science, but that I think will be of interest to this particular uh, population of, of viewers. And that's an ethical question that I'm interested in. So we, as I mentioned, we have ethicists on our team and and really the Dog Aging Project is an opportunity not just to bring different scientific questions together, but also other realms of inquiry, other areas of research, whether we're talking about economics, healthcare economics, for example, or sociology, home structure, family structure. One of the questions that I think about is, um, as we all know, and, and as we uh, heard sadly from our host, those of us who have dogs have all experienced the loss of a dog. Um, I'll mention that about uh, five years ago now, we actually had to put down our, our wine runner. We also had a wine yeah. runner. Um, and uh, as Silver, our wine runner, was struggling with uh, gut disease, um, our veterinarian spent a lot of time with us talking about his end of life care and how to keep them comfortable, and that hard decision that many of us have to make about euthanasia, but especially about end-of-life care and, and how to go through that, and, and how much are we going to spend trying to keep him alive when we don't know what's wrong with him. And those are questions that veterinarians grapple with with their patients every day. There are ethical questions that patients and veterinarians have a fair amount of comfort with because we do it, question is that I'm interested in, can we learn lessons for helping us think through the ethical challenges of our own end of life care through studies of how veterinarians and their patients do it? Mm -hmm. We have a number of questions on AI. So do you think that AI, artificial intelligence, could be used in your research? And if so, how? Um, I'm very excited about the potential for artificial intelligence and related machine learning approaches to help us identify patterns in our data and from those patterns, understand mechanisms of aging and potentially ways to prevent or delay age-related diseases, diagnose age-related diseases. Uh, so the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches or AIML is to help us identify patterns in huge data sets. I mentioned near the top that we have tens of millions of pieces of data from the surveys. We have billions of pieces of data from the genetics, and we need powerful computational tools to know what they mean. In fact, we received a special grant from NIH to help us make sure that our data, which is available publicly on the Google Cloud platform, is structured in a way that we call AI compliant, that the kinds of models that people build with artificial intelligence can easily use the data in the way that we've structured it to analyze it. So I don't yet have a specific example but of, of something that we have found, but uh, 
thinking forward, which really, you know, the, the, the resource that we're creating is really a resource for the future. And so we think a lot about the future AI experts who are going to come forward and help us think about what's in our data. In fact, we've discussed in the coming year having uh, what we call a hack week, where we invite researchers from around the world to spend a week working on our data, trying to ask questions and, and answer them using AI approaches. And our last question is asking about what is your opinion on whether there are any regulatory gaps in the oversight of companion animal research? Um, that's a good question. And I, I don't have the expertise uh, to answer that question. I'm neither a, a veterinarian nor an, nor an ethicist. Um, so I, I don't know the, the landscape. If my uh, co-founder, Dr. Creevy, uh, Dr. Kate Creevy were here, she could tell you that. I, I will say that um, in developing this clinical trial, that is the, you know, the 1% of the dogs in that triad study, um, the, the National Institute on Aging has worked really closely with us to make sure that everything that we are doing um, is done on a safety first basis. Um, and I also know, I should mention, there are, there are a few companies out there that are also uh, running or planning to run clinical trials in dogs to try and identify drugs that might, cre might increase the duration of healthy lifespan. And they're working with the FDA to make sure that they do those things in a way that is compliant with FDA requirements. So I think people, uh, the, the people in this field really appreciate that we have this unique relationship with our companion animals as members of the family and that any sorts of studies that we do in this realm are done with utmost sensitivity and safety. So I know that the project is ongoing, but is there anything you've learned thus far that was surprising to you or very interesting to you? We've learned a lot so far um, and uh, some reassuring things. Um, for example, we've done quite a bit of work on exercise. And as we might have hoped, we found that dogs that exercise more tend to be healthier. They tend to uh, have fewer diseases. They tend to have better cognitive function. Um, so not really surprising, but reassuring. Um, we've also done some uh, interesting studies on the environment. Um, and again, um, maybe not surprising, but reassuring that the dog is going to be a good model for human health. Um, researchers in uh, Dr. Noah Snyder Mackler's lab in Arizona State, a graduate student, Bree McCoy, and her colleagues found that the health of a dog is dependent on the health of its environment, in a sense. Um, dogs that live in uh, poor environments with poor air quality and less access to green coverage, trees and parks and so on, tend to be less healthy. And we know the same is true for humans, that people who are able to live in a healthier environment tend to be healthier. Um, and there are obviously important issues there around access to health care and health equity. And in that sense, we think the dog is going to be a good model for humans. Interestingly, and kind of fun, we found that dogs that live in a home with another dog tend to be healthier. We know that uh, of the things that are associated with healthy aging in people, um, diet and exercise and being a healthy weight, are important, but so is companionship. Having a good social network is really important for human aging. And it turns out that that might be true for dogs as well. Having a good canine social network might help dogs stay healthy. Well, it's such a fascinating project. So if anybody in the audience is interested in joining, um, you can go to dogagingproject.org. Is that right? That's right. And, and take a look. I'd like to thank our guest today, Daniel Promislow, for joining us. I'd like to thank the Center for Bioethics and the Museum of Science for co-sponsoring this event. And of course, my colleague, Lauren Walsh. Um, and thank you, the audience, for joining us. Uh, this has been a really, really fascinating talk, and I'm so happy that you were able to uh, share your information with us today. Thank you.
Thanks. It was really a pleasure to get to speak with your audience today. I appreciate it. Thank you.